All right, great. Okay, um, so what we're gonna do is we'll start here with a prayer and then um, I will present this material. And then hopefully if we have a little time afterwards, we will uh, be able to have some questions or a little bit of discussion. It'll be interesting again with, with uh, the audio and everything. So, but we'll do the best we can. This is technology, right? So I see, gosh, we have more people. So if, if you've just joined us, make sure to try to mute your audio or stay really silent. <laughs> okay. Okay. So I, first of all, I want to really thank everybody uh, for being here and participating in this. Um, it's kind of a new trial thing. I'm, I'm trying, I guess, just to see if this could work to try to reach out and to try to stay connected in some way and um, to talk to some about something that's kind of near and dear to my heart. And I think that will be helpful to our spiritual lives here at Our Lady Guadalupe. Um, so the beautiful thing about this format is, is, you know, if you're bored, you can just blank your screen and go to sleep and uh, you can make funny faces, whatever. You can walk, you can go to the bathroom, whatever you want, and no one's going to know. So this is kind of a beautiful uh, opportunity in a sense. So, okay, that's enough. Let's, uh, let's start with prayer, okay? And I'm going to flip over to this slide um, that I can do that. Okay. Okay. This, uh, this slide here is the, pick, the prayer we're going to pray, and it's, it's called the Prayer of Self-Dedication. And this is a prayer that was written by St. Ignatius of Loyola, who, if you know, was a soldier at one time uh, and had this very deep, profound conversion experience and really kind of surrendered his pride. He surrendered um, his former love of, of being a soldier and, and the gallantry and, and winning battles. He kind of gave all that up to give to the Lord. And so you see this picture here. He's kind of offering a very symbolic thing that has to do with his former trade of being a soldier. And he's giving that to God. He's offering that. He's making a sacrifice. And I think that image is very, it's going to be helpful to kind of guide us moving forward. Uh, as this image of giving up and offering something to God. And that was very difficult for St. Ignatius to do because he loved it. So sometimes we have to sacrifice things that we love, but for a greater good. So um, I'm just going to pray this. You can pray it with me um, silently. And um, let's look here. Pardon me. Okay. Okay, so here I go. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, amen. Take, O Lord, and receive my liberty, my memory, my understanding, and my whole will. All, I'm sorry, all that I am and all that I possess, you have given me. I surrender it all to you to be disposed of according to your will. Give me only your love and your grace. With these, I will be rich enough and will desire nothing more. Amen. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Again, a beautiful prayer often is prayed after Mass. And if you, if you really pay attention, if you like to sing here at Our Lady Guadalupe, there's actually a hymn that that prayer is based off of. It's very beautiful. Uh, this prayer of St. Ignatius of Loyola. Okay, so that, I think that sets us off on the right foot, so we'll kind of get into our material here. I like to start with a little bit of um, comic stuff, I guess, or um, some lightheartedness um, with this next slide, so um, bear with me on that. Where are we at? Okay, so this is, uh, you guys like Catholic memes. Um, I like 
I, I think they're fun and they can be very educational. But this one really caught my eye, especially uh, as we were preparing for this particular talk. You know, why are Catholics called the church militant? Uh, we have Berettas, cannons, and missiles. So obviously all of those things we know um, in, in the world to be like, you know, guns, cannons, missiles, all that stuff, projectiles. But, but in the church, those actually have a wholly, totally different meaning. Um, but um, I thought that was really cute. Um, maybe that's not the right word, cute, but <laughs> I thought it was cool. Um, because indeed we are the church militant, right? We, we're here uh, fighting evil. Uh, we're fighting the evil one and, and seeking to do good and striving to do good here on this earth. So, but anyway, I, and obviously having that word canon uh, there was really the key there. Because when we, we hear that word Roman canon, what's a Roman canon? That's like, I think if it's a we weapon or something, but that's not what we're referring to when we refer to the Roman canon. Okay, so let me move to the next slide. Okay, so the Ro I'm just going to kind of give you some basic background information here that will be helpful, hopefully. Um, this you'll see pictured here, that's the Roman Missal opened up to the page, the first page of the Roman canon. So this is what the priest might see as he is uh, praying the Mass and he turns to the Roman canon. And I think it's really important to point out that most of the missiles that we use or you'll find... Um, that's the book, again, that the, the priest prays from on the, on the altar, is there's always at the beginning of the Roman canon, canon a picture there to the left, and it's most always a picture of the cross, a picture of Calvary, the drama of Calvary. And I think that's, again, it's, it kind of sets the tone. It really tells us something. Um, and we'll really, again, get into that. And that, what does it tell us? It's like, hey, we're getting ready to, in a sense, enter into the mystery of the cross, into Calvary. And so that kind of sets the tone. You know, some people will use the hand missiles and they'll probably find the same image um, on the left side or in the beginning of the Roman canon. So what is the Roman canon? This is just simply, this is the part, maybe the easiest way to think of this is it's the part of the mass where we kneel, okay? It's the whole part of the mass where we kneel. So after the holy, 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 we all kneel together, and so begins the Roman canon. And then when that Roman canon is over, is when we say those words, you know, through him and with him and in him, and the unity of the Holy Spirit, all glory and honor is yours now and forever. So we say those words, and then we all say amen. That's the end of the Roman canon. Okay? If you've just joined us, could you? Yeah. Make sure you mute your uh, speakers. Thank you. Good. Okay. All right. So this, hopefully that makes sense. That's the Roman canon. That's, that's the part that we basically kneel for. Okay. I like to maybe refer it to it as the heart of the mass, because that's the, obviously the part of the mass where we hear the words of institution, where we have the consecration. So it's the heart of the mass. Um, obviously all the parts of the mass are important, but that's kind of the meat and that's the heart of it all. Uh, the meaning of the word canon is a Greek word, which means basically a standard or rule, a standard or rule. So like we're another place where we often hear canon in that context would be, um, we have the canon of scriptures. So we have all these books that were selected by the church as inspired by God, and that's the canon, like it can't change. It's a canon, the standard and the rule. And so it's the same thing with this. This is, this is the standard, um, the, the bar X of, of the church's prayer, as it were, okay? And then, of course, we say Roman canon because we are Roman Catholics. It comes from the Roman tradition, simply. Okay, so the Roman canon. Hopefully that kind of makes sense to you. Now, here's why why this prayer is so unique. Why is the Roman canon so unique? Well, because this prayer has organically developed over hundreds and hundreds of years, hundreds of years, and it became the standard prayer of the mass by the seventh century. Okay, so the seventh century, so like this is the 600s, 600 years after Jesus, this is the standard prayer of the church. But even before then, it was developing. 
possibly even from the apostles and the church fathers. So, I mean, think about that. We're praying the very words that the earliest Christians would have been praying. But again, it's developed. It, they added on to it over time. That's why we have this big prayer now, right? We have this big prayer. And maybe at one point, Pope Gregory the Seventh is like, you know what? Or Pope Gregory the Great, pardon me. He's like, you know what? Let's just set it in stone. Let's, this is it. This is it right here. So it developed, and he's like, okay, this is the standard. This is the canon. So think about that for a minute. Christians have been praying this prayer for literally hundreds of years, hundreds of years. And it informed our prayer, our worship, and really our faith for all these hundreds and hundreds of years. Hundreds of years. This is a very ancient, it's an old prayer, but it's beautiful because it's organically developed over time. Okay? I think that's a really important thing. We didn't, it didn't just kind of like come out of nowhere. An angel didn't pop down and say, here's the Roman canon. No, it developed in history and time into what it is now. Okay? Um, so the next question I have, or the next point I want to make is, is that, so you also see there that the Roman canon is also called Eucharistic Prayer 1. Why is that? So there's an interesting development that happened. Many of you remember this. I was, you know, not even in, in born. I existed somewhere in the mind of God, right? It was in the 1960s we had this a big event that we make a big deal out of a lot of times. It's called Vatican II, right? Where the, the church got together and they said, hey, uh, let's shake it up a little bit. <laughs> and they actually composed, the church fathers composed three other Eucharistic prayers. Uh, and actually, they composed more, too, but the, the kind of standard that you hear is one, two, three, and four. And so, and so now you, Roman canon is no longer Roman canon. It's Eucharistic prayer one. Uh, and then you have two, three, and four. And just to kind of give you a sort of a sense of that, you know, you know the, Ro the Roman canon two, or the, the Eucharistic prayer two is that really short one, you know, where it's, just, it's so short. It's like the consecration happens and boom, it's like, that's two. And then three is the one that I used to use all the time. It's a very beautiful prayer. Four, you don't hear as much. But I think I'm getting into the minutia. But the point being is, is that the reason why it's Eucharistic prayer one is because there's now three standard kind of other Eucharistic prayers to use. Okay. They're wonderful. They're great. But they're really new. I mean, they're really new. Um. So why, again, why, why would we want to use the Roman canon? What makes it, what makes it unique? I'm, I'm, I'm just going to be honest. I mean, you guys have noticed I've made a kind of a very deliberate uh, change to kind of use that exclusively. Um, and why is that? Well, because <laughs> basically what I said above, this is our heritage. This is our faith passed down from the earliest centuries. It's just as relevant now as it was back then. And it really expresses beautifully and masterfully what is taking place at the Mass. What is happening in the Mass? Well, this prayer helps us to know and understand what is going on. There's several words that you hear in the Roman canon that really point to that. And if you listen closely, you can pick them out. But there's three words you hear constantly. Sacrifice, offering, sacrifice, offering. And then the other word that sometimes people are like, what does that mean? Is oblation, oblation, which is basically something offered to God. So it's the same thing. Sacrifice, offering, oblation. These are things we constantly hear because it really helps us to know what are we doing here? There's a sacrifice taking place here, an offering. Okay. I, I don't, you know, I, I can't really speak to everybody's experience here, but, you know, I know that in, in general, my experience in the life of the parish is the Roman canon is not used very much. In fact, it was sometimes very rare. And I, I experienced kind of in my in parish life as I've experienced it in different places, kind of a, a lopsidedness to the, the liturgy of the mass being 
the liturgy of the word is this huge thing where like, okay, we got the readings. Father preaches this huge homily, which drives me nuts. And, and then we do the Eucharistic liturgy and it's like, let's get this done as quick as we can. And I've, I've always felt like we need to kind of balance those two things out. We need to balance them. Okay. That's my particular, it's so like 30 minutes, Eucharistic, uh, the liturgy of the word, 30 minutes <laughs> approximately, right? Sometimes I like to blow more steam. So, but you see what I'm saying? Okay. Hopefully you guys are picking up on this. Another uh, little point I want to make too is there's a saying that we have in the church and it's, it goes like this. The law of prayer is the law of belief. The law of prayer is the law of belief. And so what this means is how we pray really informs what we believe. How we pray informs what we believe. So if we're praying again, like the mass and we're offering us, making a sacrifice, this is an offering. We really helps us to really understand and to believe what it is we're doing at the mass. If I could tell you a story to kind of make that point even more to the point is this is a true story. This is a, a parish in our diocese. Uh, the, par the pastor was telling me that his previous pastor decided one day it was a really good idea to omit the Sunday creed at mass. He's like, you know what? This is going on too long. Let's omit this part. And so that goes on for many years. What happens? People forget it. They don't know the words. They don't know what to say. And so in a sense, that kind of is a great disservice to people. I mean, again, maybe that good intent, but a great disservice. And so, hold on just a sec. Let me turn off some audio there. Okay. Hold on just a sec. So that to me does not say, hey, let's lock down. That seems Apologize for that. That suggests that this may just be a, a transient problem in the Sun Belt states. But, I, you know, again, you I don't, I'm not going to Pollyanna you. It's not good that ICU beds are coming up, even if the hospital has to pass. Sorry about no, this, no, guys. Sick people are never good. But the question is, how do we respond to it? And it sounds like you haven't moved from your original position. I don't how can we deal with that? Okay. Yeah, that's correct. And by the way, there's not a lot of evidence that masks would help. I know that some people say, well, because there's states that don't have masks. Well, if that's true, I come from Canada, where yeah. the store line on mask point is not required. There has not been a resurgent power. There has not been a Interesting, power. really? Okay. I think we fixed that problem. Okay. Thank you. Um, I apologize for that. That's why it's really important that we, we do mute the mics because. Um, just to be respectful of everybody. Um, so let's continue on. The point I wanted to make with that is, is that simply, um, basically, oh wait, so the pastor, he comes along, right? And he goes to pray the creed his first day there and nobody knows it. Nobody knows it. Again, how sad is that? So the law of prayer is the law of belief. Okay, so that's kind of a good introduction, a basic introduction. And, you know, these next two talks tomorrow and Thursday, they're really going to get into the nitty gritty of all the text and all the words and what we're saying. But I want to, my whole point, what I want to do anyway, is I really want to set the tone and kind of give us a context for this so that whenever we do pray the, um, we pray the mass, we pray the Roman canon, we're going to enter into it, um, I think, more equipped uh, to really participate and to enter into it. Okay. Um, so I'm going to, here's what I'm going to talk about for the next, I don't know, 20 so minutes is the following. Uh, these three points I'm going to make is these three truths. The mass uh, is a sacrifice. The mass is a sacrifice. This is, we need to understand what is taking place. Uh, and point number two will be that we all uh, exercise a baptismal priesthood. This, and then finally, 
what is this whole thing about full conscious and active participation? And all those three things, when we talk about them, they're all going to just tie together perfectly. They're all going to just come together and um, kind of make more sense, I believe. Okay. So let's kind of get into these. Okay. So let's first talk about how the mass is a sacrifice. You'll see in this photo here, I've got, this is, I think this really says it all to me. Um, you have there on the right side, uh, a priest offering the mass. And that was probably the way they offered it prior to 1960s. Uh, but the, I think the point is, is, hey, he's offering mass. But really what is going on is over on the left side there is Calvary. We are living in, at that moment, we are at Calvary. That one eternal sacrifice of Jesus made present, being offered to God for his glory and honor and for reparation for the sins of the whole world. If you see that quote there at the have at the bottom, that's from um, what many of you might be familiar with, the Baltimore Catechism. Maybe you grew up with that. The beauty of the Baltimore Catechism is it put it everything so succinctly and clearly. <laughs> And so most of the young people of the time that used that would have known what, this, what, it, what the Mass is. The Mass is the sacrifice of the new law in which Christ, through the ministry of the priest, offers himself to God in an unbloody manner under the appearances of bread and wine. So it's very clear. We, you know, we understand that the Mass is a sacrifice, the sacrifice of Jesus made present. I'm going to read you, uh, this is from the Catechism of the Catholic Church. This is the New Catechism, and here's how they put the same point. It's a little bit more wordy. It says, this comes from, by the way, Catechism 1364. When the church celebrates the Eucharist, she commemorates Christ's Passover, and it is made present. The sacrifice Christ offered once for all on the cross remains ever present. As often as the sacrifice of the cross by which Christ our Pasch has been sacrificed is celebrated on the altar, the work of our redemption is carried out. So when we come to Mass, it's the drama of the cross represented, represented there before us. Obviously, we know that the Mass has many facets. It's also a sacred meal, a sacred banquet, right? But I think that's been really emphasized to the point where we forget that it is a sacrifice. It's a banquet because we come to the Eucharistic table to eat of the body and blood of the Lord. But first, it, you know, we also, we, but the first we partake in the fact that and offer ourselves in the sacrifice. There's no, in a sense, communion without sacrifice. So we need, I think, I think we do need to kind of recapture that because I feel that that has been lost. This is my opinion. Um, I feel like as I, as I encounter people's understanding of the mass, I see a lot of people will just kind of like, well, it's a night. Yeah, it's a meal. It's like a banquet. It's a meal. Okay. It is, but it's also a sacrifice. So a couple of things that really point to that reality that we need to think about is first and foremost, when we look up in that sanctuary, we should be able to see a crucifix. We should be able to see a crucifix to help us to remember, ah, this is what is taking place. I think we're really blessed at Our Lady of Guadalupe because we have a very visible crucifix. It's like, you can't mistake it, right? You can't, you can't like, oh, I don't see anything, right? So it's, it's very there and present. It's a beautiful thing. Um, when we're, where are we celebrating the Mass? Well, that table is actually really an altar. And an altar is a place of sacrifice. So, so I think that's important. That is an altar an altar is where sacrifices are offered. Another way that we can think of that is, you know, when we consecrate the two species of bread and wine, they become the body and blood, and they are separated. And whenever you separate blood from the body, that signifies sacrifice, right? The blood, blood is shed. So I think that that's something to kind of think about. Okay, so, so these things point to sacrifice. You know, what? something else I just thought of is, and we don't often think of this, is, but the candles, candles at the Mass also signify sacrifice because we burn them and they consume themselves to give off light 
And notice the candles, they get shorter and shorter and shorter and shorter. That's, that's, that means sacrifice. So all these things point to that beautiful reality. I want to uh, give you a little quote from a saint um, who I think he's a very credible saint. <laughs> uh, saint Padre Pio, you can't go wrong with him. But he says the following. Renew your faith by attending Holy Mass. Keep your mind focused on the mystery that is unfolding before your eyes. In your mind's eye, transport yourself to Calvary and meditate on the victim who offers himself to divine justice, paying the price of your redemption. So see there, uh, Padre Pio is clearly pointing out that the Mass is Calvary. The Mass is Calvary. Okay? So that's, that's what I'm going to say about the Mass as a sacrifice. This next point uh, about our baptismal priesthood is very important, and I hope you can uh, benefit from this. Okay, so I'm going to click on to this. Okay, so don't look too much at the picture, but I'll get into it. So now each of us, okay, so first of all, there is only one priest, okay? There's only one priest, the eternal high priest, and his name is Jesus Christ, true God and true man. And he has made the ultimate sacrifice for us. He is the one priest. However, because of his goodness, he has allowed us humans to participate in his own priesthood. And he allows us to participate in his priesthood in two different ways. One is through the ministerial priesthood. So through holy orders, men serve as priests to be at the service of the common priesthood. Okay, so that's the one sharing in the priesthood is the ministerial priesthood, like myself, Father Gabe. And our job is to serve the common priesthood or the priesthood of the faithful. We're at your service. Then you have the other sharing, which is the common or baptismal priesthood. And this is all of the faithful. If you are baptized, you share in the common priesthood of Jesus. And you exercise that ministry of priesthood. What is the job of a priest? To pray and offer sacrifice. To pray and offer sacrifice. So all of us are called to do that. It's to pray and offer sacrifice, okay? So, where does that come to us from? It comes to us at our baptism. So when we are baptized, we were consecrated as priests of the new covenant, giving us the power to pray and offer sacrifice and worship. Obviously, you know, many of us, when we were baptized, we were little babies, we didn't really fully comprehend what was understand what was happening to us, but we grew into it because our parents helped us to come to, 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 to know that and to develop and cultivate faith. Not only our parents, but the whole Christian community. Here's a, I want to read you a quote from the catechism. And this kind of points to this fact that the common priesthood is when they're baptized, they're consecrated for worship, for sacrifice, and prayer. So the celebrating assembly is the community who, by regeneration and the anointing of the Holy Spirit, are consecrated to be a spiritual house and a holy priesthood, that through all the works of Christian men, they may offer spiritual sacrifices. Okay? So know of your great dignity as you know, priests of the new covenant, our common priesthood, okay? Some, some things I want to point out to you um, in the, the rite of baptism actually allude to this fact. Um, so if some of you have been, if you're getting ready to go a baptiz to a baptism, or if you've been to one recently, maybe try to pay attention to this. But, but after the baptism of the child at the baptismal font, the priest anoints the little baby with oil of chrism, which chrism is used, you know, to, um, to confirm and also 
it's put on the hands of priests to consecrate their hands. But the priest says these words to really point to this fact. So Almighty God, Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, has freed you from sin, giving you a new birth by water and the Holy Spirit, and joined you to his holy people. He now anoints you with the chrism of salvation so that you may remain as a member of Christ, priest, prophet, and king unto eternal life. So kind of alluding immediately to the fact that this baptized child now participates in the one priesthood of Jesus Christ. After the baptism and after those, those kind of post-baptismal rites, the priest then with the family takes that baby up to the altar. And that is very significant, very significant. It's a little subtle thing, but like, so we go from the font to the altar. And you can, if you refer to that image there, so we go to the, from the baptismal font, we take the baby up to the altar and we, we say this prayer first, this introductory prayer. Dear brothers and sisters, this child reborn through baptism is now called a child of God, for so indeed they are. Through confirmation, they will receive the fullness of the Spirit, and approaching the altar of the Lord, they will share at the table of his sacrifice and will call upon God as Father in the midst of the church. So we're already pointing out to the fact that, hey, so you are baptized a priest, and you will exercise that as you get older right here at this altar. This is where you will pray. This is where you will partake of the Lord. Isn't that beautiful? I mean, that connection. And hopefully we can see, like hopefully we can, our young people, the, the families that come to us, hopefully they can see that connection of, wow, your little baby has become a royal priest and is going to offer sacrifice on this altar um, and to worship God in this way. Obviously, that worship at the altar informs a whole way of living because our whole life should be an offering to God continually, offering Him praise and thanksgiving in all that we do. Okay, and then I, I kind of put the added up too, like, so we, we, practice, we live all of our lives, you know, offering and worshiping God at the altar in our life, in our world, but now we, we, we do that in preparation for something, worship of God in heaven. You know, Revelation has that vision of heaven where the angels gather around the throne of the Lamb, adoring Him forever. And really, that's what we will be, will be like in heaven, is that adoration and praise. It all begins here, though, on earth. We prepare for that. Uh-oh, I'm getting ahead of myself. Uh, we prepare for that right here at the altar, so that when we get to heaven, we'll be ready for it. Okay? Isn't that beautiful? Yeah. Okay. Um, all right. So, mm, here we go. Personally, I think if we all, if we were to come more aware of that thing, if that, that truth, I think that would be a big game changer for many of us. If we come to the, to mass as like, Hey, you know, I am a, I participate in, in the priestly role of Christ. And this is a very important role, and I'm going to exercise that. I'm going to do that well to give glory and praise to God. Okay. Okay. Finally, let's get to our last point. And that is this whole idea of full, conscious, and active participation. So I'm going to don't laugh or whatever, okay? Okay. Um, so this phrase was very uh, was kind of a big phrase that was touted at the Second Vatican Council. Whenever they 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 wrote the document on the reform of the liturgy, as they were like, "Hey, the, our primary aim in doing all this is so that people can more fully, actively, and consciously participate in the Mass." What does that mean? I think, I think that there was a little bit of misunderstanding because when we think of that, we think, oh, that means I've got to be doing something. I've got to have an active role. Like maybe I need to be an usher or a reader, extraordinary minister. I need to actively do something. No, no, no. I, 
really what we're talking about there is we want to point to, we want an interior participation, an interior participation of the Mass. Um, it means we want to be fully present and aware and conscious of what is taking place. You know, we, sometimes we show up at Mass, maybe we're thinking about the hundreds of different things we have to do. We're distracted, whatever it might be, but we want to remember, no, I'm here as exercising my baptismal priesthood to offer sacrifice. I'm here to be at Calvary with our Lord, to receive his graces and fruits, to be strengthened and nourished by them. So we, that's what we want to be aware of and conscious of. That's really what we're talking about. We be fully, and so be fully engaged is to then really make that interior act of offering to God, to offer our lives and our hearts in union with Jesus' sacrifice on the cross. I think that's a really important point there. That's what we're doing when we come to Mass. We are making an offering of our lives, of our hearts, of all of our sorrows and joys, all the stuff that we carry. We bring it to the altar. We lay it there. Our offerings, they're like... They're really nothing. But in union with Jesus, they become very powerful and acceptable to God. You see, Jesus makes our offering perfect because he is perfect. This is so important. That's how we can really actively participate fully and consciously at Mass. If we come mindfully, if we, you know, if we come to offer ourselves in our hearts. Whenever we pray the Mass, all the mass, all the prayers of the Mass, pretty much all of them, are addressed to the Father, to God the Father. But we're always praying to God the Father in Christ and through the Holy Spirit. So because we're gathered as the mystical body of Christ, we're able to offer ourselves and our lives to God the Father. I think that's really important that we, we're always praying to the Father when we pray those prayers, particularly the Roman canon. Okay. And again, this is, you know, we don't, we don't just, when we worship and we pray at mass is that that's the primary place, of course, but like we do, we don't, we, we go out into the world and we live that as well. Each and every day, we, we make an offering of our lives to God, the father. Um, we continue to do that as Christians out in the world. Okay. Another point to make is, that only we can make that offering of ourselves. Nobody can do that for us. Only we can do that. Um, no one can force us. Like you will make an offering. No, that's a, that's, we do that freely and we do it out of love. Okay. We do it freely and out of love. And this is the beauty of being made in the image and likeness of God is he has given us this gift of free will. And he wants us to freely come to him offering of our hearts, and our lives. It's very opposite of what Adam and Eve did, right? They didn't make an offering. They grasped. They grasped at that fruit of the knowledge of good and evil. God doesn't want us to grasp and take. He wants us to offer. And he will give us back something even greater. His very self. His very self. Okay, so hopefully that kind of makes sense to you. We'll have a little time for discussion. Finally, I want to say, before the Roman canon, there is what is called the preface, the preface dialogue in particular. And you all know what this part is. And it's very fitting that we pray this preface dialogue before the Roman canon, because again, we talk about, again, offering, making sacrifice, oblation. We say these words. I say, of course, the Lord be with you. You respond and with your spirit. And then I pray that, and then I say, lift up your hearts. You see? And we say, we lift them up to the Lord. So literally, we want to like, not literally, literally like, <laughs> but we want to spiritually lift our hearts to the Lord. That's an invitation to offer and to make an offering in and through Jesus. 
And then finally, let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right and just. In our offering and offering of praise, we're giving the Lord thanks for all his many blessings and gifts. What an awesome way to really enter and to encounter the, um, the Roman canon, the praying the mass. So uh, maybe I want to make a few comments on these pictures. I didn't get to do that yet. Obviously, the guy on the left, that's a really, that's a strong exaggeration. Um, maybe once I've seen that. <laughs> um, it probably wasn't an adult. <laughs> um, and, but I will be honest with you, as I look out sometimes and see people, their body language, um, their faces, Sometimes I, I'm like, are we in, really engaged? Are we praying? You know, I, I, and I think, and again, like we're, we're both body and soul. And so when our bodies show alertness and attentiveness, that really does help our spirit, our soul enter more into the mass. You know, if we're, if, what is that called whenever people kneel down on their butts on the, on the pew, you know, <laughs> I, you know, obviously if like you're in pain, you have knee problems, like that's, that's fine. But like our Lord deserves the best and our attention to try to do good. And that will help us to pray. So you look at this young man, he is actively participating, but he looks like he almost, like it's very passive. You notice like he's, it's an interior thing. Like this little kid gets it. Like everything, when I look at him, it says I'm engaged. He knows what's going on. That's why I like this picture. It's no, he's not like raising his hands and blah, blah. Like he, you know, that's not active participation. It's interior. It's interior. You know, when we hold our hands like this, where does it go? It goes here, right next to our heart. It's pointed it's to heaven. That's why we pray like that, you know, because we, it directs our hearts to heaven. You're lifting up our hearts to the Lord. We're making an offering. Okay. Finally, I'm just going to give you this pet picture here. I love this picture. You've maybe seen it before. Um, the mass is boring, said no angel, saint, or holy soul in purgatory ever. And, and this, you know, that's what's taking place at the mass, man, right there, you know, is, is heaven and earth are joined. All the angels and saints are present, worshiping and adoring the Lord. And the souls in purgatory are being refreshed and being thrown into heaven, you know, like, so like, this is exciting stuff. How could we not like this? How could we not be excited about it? But how often do we forget what is taking place? You know, so, and that's, and this is why it's helpful in, in the churches to have like verticality and, and, you know, images of saints, because it helps us to remember that we are in heaven. We are like, we are at the heavenly banquet right there. Um, it's, I, I just think the more we can keep mindful of this, it will really help us to keep our minds focused. It will help us to understand what's going on. Okay. All right. So I'm going to, what I'm going to do is try to open it up for any questions and what the best way to do that might be is if you can unmute yourself and ask your question, that would be the best thing, hopefully, if you have a question uh, or comment or anything. Hey, Father, it's yeah. uh, Brian Graham here. Brian, uh, great. Quick, quick question at the beginning. You said that when you were talking about the different uh, Eucharistic prayers, you said you used to say prayer three yeah. and liked it, and now you've switched to one. What did you, what are the differences? Why did you like number three and why did you then quit using it? Yeah. Okay, great. Thanks for that question, Brian. That was a good question. Um, so again, kind of going back is I began to realize the richness of Eucharistic prayer one and how it's so rooted in our tradition, how it's so ancient um, and it's, you know, how it organically developed over hundreds and hundreds of years and how really it informed the Christian's faith for for so many years before us. And I really am like, you know what? And, and like, again, like I just felt like, I don't think we're using this enough. Eucharistic prayer three is beautiful. Okay. It's beautiful. And one of the things that it really draws out is this 
theology of how the Eucharist unites us and makes us one, which is beautiful. Like, so like there's a different emphasis there, um, but it does it have the richness of Eucharistic prayer one. I don't think it does. Again, there's nothing wrong with using it. I typically will use it at funerals because um, it does have a specific prayer for the dying um, that I really like to include. So, um, and I'm, I'm just going to be really honest too with you guys. Like there was an internal struggle. Um, Eucharistic prayer one is very long. It's very long. It's the longest of all of them. But if, if you look at comparatively, it's maybe like maybe two minutes longer. And so I was inside, I was like, gosh, I don't want to take more time up. I'm afraid that, the, you know, people might get impatient, da, da, da. This is my internal dialogue. But then one day I said, you know what? Don't worry about that. Do what you feel called to do. Offer to God this prayer. And if people are upset by that, you know, God bless them, you know. That's, I'll just be really, I'll bluntly honest. That's, that's what was, and I finally just kind of pulled the trigger and feel like I've benefited from that. So great question. Thank you. Okay. What else? Question. Father, I have a question. Yeah, Diane. When you talk about, um, I see you lift up your heart. I have a question. Do we raise our arms? Do we look up? I'm not sure. I always look up, but I, I don't think that's right, is it? Right. So, okay, good. Good question. Um, uh, the rubrics don't actually prescribe any motion of the faithful. Um, oh, the priest okay. does do this, but okay. the faith, you're not really, it's, there's no prescription to do anything. Um, I think there are some things that people have kind of uh, take it on. And uh -huh. that's, you know, again, like, I can't fault that. I'm not going to be like, don't do that. Like, right. you know what I'm saying? Because like, if yeah. you're engaged interiorly, praise God. Okay. So, well, I'm glad you brought that up because it, it, I was really confused because I thought, well, maybe that's what we need to do, kind of lifting up. But no, it has a totally different meaning. I appreciate that. Help me. Mm -hmm. Thanks. Yeah. Thank you for the question. Father? Yes. Can you hear me? Okay. Yeah, it's Kelly. Okay. So, first off, I just want to make a comment that, um, you know, since, you know, praying, you know, with your hands together, you know, that since I started doing that, which sometimes I forget, but since I started doing that, it makes me more, um, just, I don't know, like I pay more attention when I have my hands like that, you know, yeah. I don't know why, but, um, and the other thing about offering, you know, I, what you said, I'm here practicing my baptismal priesthood and offering my sacrifice in and through Jesus. So we're offering our sorrows and our joys. So, you know, when I was growing in my faith and questioning anything and everything, I was like, okay, how do I offer, how do I offer my life? Do I have to think of all my joys and sorrows, you know, or, you know, what do I have to say anything in my head or is it just that, you know what I'm saying? Yeah. Okay. This is a very good question. Okay. Very good question. Because I struggle with that same thing, you know. But here's the thing. God knows your heart. He knows everything. He knows your joys and struggles. So all you got to say is like, <laughs> take it. He knows. He knows. Like just be, give yourself that freedom, you know. You don't have to name every little thing. That's going to take a long time, right? You know. Right, right, right. And so, and then my thought was, then too then when you go out into your day and you have sorrows and joys and when you have sorrows that you really shouldn't complain about them because you've just offered them to god right yeah. Ooh, i like that yeah okay. yeah yeah okay so then my ex other question or comment is you know i've heard you know you offer up mass for a specific intention you know i know you know mass is said for someone but like my son last week i said i'm gonna go to mass it was <laughs> it was harder for me after you know the quarantine to get back to daily mass because i had to wake up earlier and my kids are home and i'm busy da, da, da. anyway 
So I, my son was taking tests last week and every day I told him, I'm going to mask for you this morning to offer my mask for you. And that helped me get up because I, I knew I was doing it for somebody. I was doing it for my son. So is that something that we should do every day? Like offer our mask for something? And then also I've heard that you can offer your communion too for something different. Yeah. Okay, so that's that's a really good question too. And I'll say this, like, um, yeah, so the the mass, we should be bringing our intentions to the mass for sure. Like there's that one assigned attention that like the priest will pray as the main intention, but that doesn't prevent anybody from bringing their own intentions that they bring. And they can be legion. They can be as many as you want. So So it is kind of nice to have kind of that one specific special one though. If that gets you up in the morning, praise God. Like, you know, like it's, it's, it's kind of like, this is mission, you know, I'm going to pray for this person, you know? Um, so, so yeah, absolutely. Um, and I think that that kind of also would entail the, the offering the communion as well. You know, you're offering that for a specific intention and our intentions can be as numerous as, as we want. Good. That's a really good question. Okay, I don't mean to, so when you say, I understand offering the mass because you get your butt up out of bed and you go to church and that was a sacrifice and I'm going to offer this up for, you know, my son to do good on his tests, but what does offering up the communion mean? Again, think of it like, gosh, I don't know how to say this, but like, you're, you're, all, you're ultimately offering the sacrifice of Jesus on the cross, right? In union with him. That's, that's the bottom line. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Don't separate the two. Okay. Sure. Okay. Okay. Thank you. And maybe, maybe the guy's uh, father, Gabe, you might have something to add on that or uh, Sam or anybody else. Yeah. I'll just add one, one thing, father. Um, the one way that I had, I have heard it described before is like the, the communion is part of, of the sacrifice. It's a part of the greater sacrifice of the mass your specific communion, and you can offer that for whatever you want, just like you can offer the mass for uh, whatever specific intention you want. So it's, it's really, there's a lot of it that's up to you. And um, of course, you know, God knows the heart and, and, and searches the mind and probes the heart um, and is able to know every kind of interior need and desire even before we express it. So uh, there's that, there's that uh, kind of to think about maybe, I don't know if that helps, I hope it does. Thank you. Okay. I want to. Yeah. What is a Beretta? Okay. Uh, is this Keith? Yeah. Keith. Okay. Good. So a Beretta in the church is actually a hat that's worn by uh, the clergy, and um, I wish I could show you mine. It's, I think it's over in the rectory because I don't really ever wear it. <laughs> um, but it's got a little, it's got like three kind of horns on it. And it's got a little poofy ball on the top. <laughs> um, that's called a Beretta. So it's not a... Did Father Harkin used to wear that? Yeah, Did more Did Father so Harkin than, wear his a lot? Well, yeah. he would wear his a lot. Yeah. 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 So that's a Beretta. Yeah. Okay. Well, I knew about the gun, but I wasn't sure about the other. There he is. So Sam is, if you can see Sam's screen, he is modeling the Beretta. So, <laughs> see, see, a little poofy hat. And <laughs> so what's a Beretta? I mean, what's a, a miter then? Same thing or not? No, the miter is the pointy one with the bishop wears. Oh, okay. Thanks. Mm -hmm. What, uh, what was the other question, Keith? I'm sorry. Okay, I didn't. Oh, that, that was the Okay. Thank you. Okay. I want to give everybody an opportunity. So don't be shy. Okay. Going once. <laughs> Go 
going twice. <laughs> Okay. Okay. So, so I'll ask a question here. Oh, good. Yeah. On your last, on your last slide here, you're talking about alt souls and purgatory. Yeah. So, my question is, you know, we've gone through a period where, you know, there is purgatory, there is a purgatory. Do we all go to purgatory until we're, you know, what I'm saying? Wow. Okay. You bring up, this is good. This is a good question. So there's always been purgatory. Always. The church has always taught that. However, there's been a period of time where it's like, eh, let's not talk about that. We don't like that. <laughs> and I'm just going to be flat out honest. It wasn't preached about. And that's, again, that's remember Lex credendi, Lex, the law of prayer is the law of belief. When we pray, we're always, what are we, we're praying for the dead all the time. Why would we pray for the dead? If they're in hell, there ain't no hope. <laughs> if they're in heaven, they don't need our prayers. But if they are in this in-between state, this can assist them. This can assist them. Now, whether, where a soul goes, this is not for us to decide. This is for God to decide. Like, I can't say, oh, that person is in hell. That person's heaven. I can't say that. What I do, like, for example, I'm just going to speak really frankly. My, my good friend, Father Harkins, circumstances were not the best. I don't know where he's at, but gosh darn it, I'm going to pray for him. I'm going to keep praying and keep praying. My grandparents, my family, and I'm going to entrust them to the mercy of our good God. And that's all we can do. You know, sometimes though, I think God gives us little signal graces to kind of help us. I really think that like to make, like be like, Oh, I think they are okay. You know, I think God does that. That's just me though. That's my opinion. So purgatory, I, this, maybe we could talk about that a whole nother day, this purgatory stuff. I love that. That's good stuff, but it's all about the mercy of God. Can people die and go straight to heaven? Absolutely. I, I believe that. Or maybe purgatory is like this. <laughs> like, you know, God's outside of time. He's outside of time. You know, it could, it could be like this. <laughs> yeah. So, good. Thank you. Yeah. Okay. Okay. That brings up another question for me. So, how, so if we're praying for somebody in purgatory and they're not there, they're already in heaven or they're in hell. Yeah. How would we know that we should not do it anymore? Yeah. You do it anyway, because God will put that prayer to use wherever it's needed. Again, we can't, this is something that we can't like be certain or know of or, but we just, we pray and God, he takes care of it. He uses that prayer where needed. I've heard before uh, people talking about like uh, having masses said for say someone who dies and yep. a lot of the times I think that's really common like right away but I've heard people say no you should continue to do that because you have no idea if that years later that person could still be in purgatory and could still use that mass said for them. Sure and absolutely you know and I think too you got to remember that like so God is outside of time He's outside of time. So like he like he knew that this mass was going to be offered for this person, like even before before it was, <laughs> you know? So th there's even this anticipatory, like the sense of like where God can use that even though it hasn't even happened yet. You see? This is this is the this is the this is to me it's mind boggling because God is outside of time. We can pray for that person. Like, like here, think of it like this way. And this is, this is part of our theology. Like, let's say somebody, let's say there's an awful circumstance of suicide. But maybe at that very instant, there was a moment of repentance. We don't know the person's soul. We don't know that. But maybe that repentance was brought on by a special grace that was your prayer that you were going to pray for that person in the future. It's kind of mind-blowing, I know. Like, but, like, but we believe that. <laughs> So our prayers are always good 
for people, even if they've passed on, because they can have a retroactive effect because God is outside of time. It's beautiful. Okay, so that makes me think about, um, which I never understood, Fatima and Mary saying, you know, to pray because many souls go to hell. And I thought, well, then what's the sense of, but is that what she means then? Pray because many souls are destined to go to hell? Do you know what I'm saying? Do you know sure. what, I'm, what quote it is that I'm thinking right. about? But that's where our prayers can, like you say, it's outside of time. So yeah. if you pray, okay. Exactly. I don't know that exact quote, but yeah, there's always, there's hope. We should never like despair right. or have hopelessness for, for souls ever. Yeah. We pray for them. Pray, pray, pray. Pray like, the, pray like they're in purgatory and hope that they're in heaven. Amen. I like that. And like, cause like whenever I die, I hope that people will pray for me and offer masses. Cause like, please <laughs> like, don't be like father Christian. He was such a holy priest. Like, uh, no, just, no, I'm a man, I'm a sinner, and I need prayers, you know? <laughs> Please. <laughs> hey, Father. Yes. What happens to the people in purgatory that don't have anybody to pray for them? Oh, wow. Ooh, We're kind of getting, maybe we need to have a talk, maybe we need to have a talk on purgatory. And <laughs> so, I mean, uh, Pray for family, people, and always, you know, uh, people that are close to me. What happens to the people who don't have anybody? Yeah. So I think that would be a call for perhaps you personally to pray for all souls. The church has this feast day, all souls, where we literally say all souls are prayed for. You know, I, I will sp say my, me personally during the canon of the mass, and I know one of the guys will get into this next time, is there's that place where we pray for the dead. And you can mention specifically silently your own like person who has passed on. And I always say the following words, all souls. So the church is always praying for all souls. There is no abandoned or neglected soul. We pray for all souls. And you can do that personally. You know, to pray for those who have no one to pray for them. Just let's blanket it on there. It's a good question. I pray for everybody. Thank you. Thank you. I found a rosary uh, prayer that is for all souls. And I pray it every time I'm in the car when I'm driving. Good. Really? That's perfect. This is helpful. Thank you. Okay. Okay, for me. Okay. Um, well, I think this is great. I, uh, I really appreciate you guys participating, and I hope that you can come to uh, the next two. If you can't, we're going to record them all the same. And... Um, um yeah god, god bless you i hope you have a good night and hopefully this was helpful to you thank you it was wonderful okay thank you father stay thank safe you. Thank you, god bless. okay have okay. a blessed night thank you father bye, bye. are we getting off now